Um, it's in a very nice conference. So far, all lectures were really outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, of a very high level. And therefore, I want to, uh, to compensate for that by giving a very low level talk and a very elementary one. And uh, I would like to talk about uh, uh, locally testable codes. Uh, I'll, I, uh, most of the talk will be completely elementary. Uh, uh, if I have time, I will try at the, f at the last few minutes to be a uh, little bit more advanced. I hope it will be still understood, but let me start. So let F, uh, you don't have a pointer, I guess, to that I can, you have, get. Ah, oh, that's Melkit. This will make my life much easier. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, I have to be a little bit closer. Okay, uh, let, let FQ be a field of order Q. Usually Q will be equal to 2. Uh, and NKDQ, if Q equal 2, we will omit this, the, this Q. Code is nothing more than just a subspace of FQ to the N of dimension K and distance at least D. What, what, what we mean by distance? Distance means the minimum of the amming distance between any two, non, any two vectors, alpha and beta, in the code. Because we are, we are really talking today only about what is called linear codes, which means that if alpha and beta are in the code, then alpha minus beta is also in the code. And therefore, this is exactly the same as the minimum of the amming weight of alpha when alpha runs over all the non-zero vectors in, in C. And of course, I don't have to explain to this sophisticated audience that the code, uh, the importance of a correcting code is that we want to send k bits of information. Instead of that, we're sending n, which is slightly larger, and we want to spread them in such a way that they will be kind of far apart from each other so that we can correct mistakes if there is some noise along this uh, channel. And uh, uh, so that's kind of an important engineering pro problem, but we are not engineers, we are mathematicians. So we will talk about the case when n is going to infinity. So from now on, even if I use the word code, I always mean a family of codes that, that, the, that uh, uh, n is going to infinity. And then when I say a code is good, what uh, the standard terminology uh, means that there exists some epsilon greater than zero, such that the dimension of the code is at least epsilon n and the distance is at least epsilon n. Namely, both the dimension and the distance grows linearly, uh, linearly with n. To start with, uh, the, the standard terminology is to normalize and to talk about the rate of the code, which is k over n, and, and the normalized distance. Sometimes people, people call this the distance, delta of c, which is d over n. So what we really want is that the rate and the normalized distance are both bounded away uh, from zero. And it's, to start with, it's not even... Uh, and this is in the, in, the, in the standard terminology in the area. This means constant ray and constant distance. To start with, it's not even clear that such codes exist, but uh, it's going back to the very early uh, stage of this theory that random codes, which defined by random constraints, namely by just a random a matrix or random uh, lin uh, uh, linear functionals define a good code in this sense. And later on, the old theory was about having explicit constructions and various other, va various other, uh, various other properties. So uh, <coughs> I'm not going to cover um, in this short talk uh, 70 years of uh, uh, of history, and luckily so that I cannot, because I really cannot. I'm not an expert on that. It's, it's, uh, all this is a kind of a new area for me. 
But let me jump already to the 60s. In the 60s, Gallagher defined an ocean which was a little bit ahead of his time, uh, but uh, 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 later on, uh, it was found out to be extremely important. Uh, uh, the name is terrible, but the, the notion is important. A code is called LDPC, Low Density Parity Check. Computer scientists love initials. <laughs> and, uh, uh, LDPC, Low Density Parity Check. If C is defined by equations or linear functional or constraint, these are all uh, synonyms, with bounded support, namely the functions which define the linear space, a bounded support. Another way to say it, if, if, if we look at C perp, namely all the vectors uh, beta in F to the N, which are orthogonal, to the code, orthogonal just means like you look at the standard scalar product, alpha and beta equals sigma AI BI. So uh, 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 such a BI define equations on, uh, uh, which is satisfied by the code if this is zero. So you want that C perp as, as a basis with bounded support. Namely, in C, we don't, have, we don't want to have vectors with small support. In C perp, we do want to have uh, vectors with even with bounded support. He defined this notion and he, and he proved that random codes defined by random equations or bounded support are still good. <coughs> um, <coughs> and, um, but finding explicit construction turns out to, to be much more difficult. And this had to wait to the 90s when Sips, Sips and Spielman uh, made the first explicit construction, what, what they called expander codes, which are LDPC good codes. Now, I really want to do the, basically the full construction and, and essentially the full proof of the Sip of Spielman because this is kind of the first floor of our work and we built a second floor and you and you'll see in a minute that when I say second floor I don't I don't mean in a, in a metaphoric way I really mean that it's really a second floor above their uh, their construction so let me explain the Sipter Spielman. Uh, actually, this, was, this, this is so elementary, you'll see. In 10 minutes, I will cover it all. You can cover it in an elementary undergraduate course. And when a Sips, when a Spielman got the Navalina Prize, this was praised as one of his three uh, big works because it was, uh, uh, it was so uh, fundamental and somehow influenced the area ever since then. And uh, it's even... Uh, kind of important in real life. Okay, so let X now uh, be a finite R regular graph. The eigenvalues, which by, by this we mean the eigenvalues of the IJCC matrix are all lies in the, uh, in the interval minus RR, right? If we take, we take a graph, the IJCC matrix is a symmetric matrix, all eigenvalues are are real and it's a lit, uh, just an easy exercise to see that they must be between minus R and R. R is always an eigenvalue. If you take the constant function, the constant vector on the vertices, this is going to be the eigenfunction. Um, and this R is always the largest one. The one which is the most important is the second to largest lambda x, which will denote it lambda of x. And lambda of x, by the way, is strictly less than r if and only if x is a connected graph. So we will assume we really care now about connected graphs. And here is a definition. There are uh, 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 several equivalent definitions to this no notion of expander, but this is one of them. X is called lambda expander. Lambda now will be some fixed number between, uh, less than R. And X is called lambda expander if lambda of X is at most lambda. So we want lambda to be bounded away to say, again, 
I say a graph is expanded, but what I really care is about an infinite family of R regular graph for the same R, and the size of the graphs is going to infinity. And a, a, a family of expander, we really mean that R is fixed, lambda is fixed, and the size of the graphs are going to infinity. Morally, if lambda of x less than R means connected, then lambda of x bounded away from R means very connected in a kind of a uniform, a uniform way to the, to the whole family. And this, is, uh, this notion is of... Uh, extremely important in uh, computer science. Uh, the, the graph X is called Ramanujan. Ramanujan graphs, if lambda of X is less, it should be really there, less or equal, uh, not less, less or equal, two square root of R minus one. Why two square root R, R minus one is so important? Well, for basically for two reasons. One of them is the alone a Bopana um, uh, results, which says that you cannot do re really better than this number. These are kind of the optimal expander, at least if you talk about infinite family of our little graph, and one can explain the, it because the universal cover of an R regular graph is the R regular tree. A classical theorem of Keston says that the a JCC operator on L2 of the infinite R regular tree uh, uh, is in the interval minus 2 square R minus 1 till 2 square R minus 1. So in a way, these are the, the eigenvalues which are coming from the universal cover. So I, mean, I will be a little bit vaguer. It's not at all clear that you can achieve a such... Uh, uh, such an uh, uh, expander, but uh, already in the 60s, uh, Margulis and uh, 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 Phillips and Sarnak and me, and then a student of mine, uh, did it for prime, prime plus one, uh, 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 power of primes. Uh, and, and somehow the name Ramanujan is attached to that. There is a long, long history. Nowadays, you don't really need all this. Some of it you can use. Uh, I'm just mentioning it in passing. Uh, but uh, that we have a source of graph such that the second largest eigenvalue is much smaller than, than the one. And we don't really need here the full Ramanujan, but I don't have to time to explain. So let me now, after giving this uh, a brief introduction, let me now give you the complete Sips per Spielmann construction. So, they, they said the following. Okay, you remember, we want to, 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 uh, to uh, create a code. A code for us at this point is just a subspace of a vector space F2 to the N. Okay, so let X be an R regular lambda expander graph on M vertices. Again, we really, the, the way, Code means infinitely many codes. So here we, we, we're talking about infinitely many graphs, but we fix R, we fix lambda, and the M, the number of vertices, will go to infinity. Now, let's see zero be a subspace of F to do the R, which we will call it in our terminology, the small code. Now, R is fixed, right? So that's not going to be our code. It's just going to be one, fixed subspace of F0 to the R. In a minute, I will give you the, what we expect this C0 to, to have, but at this point, I just take it as a, as a subspace, and we, we are going to label the R edges around every vertex by the number 1 up to R. And we don't as assume a, any consistency, namely, if I have an edge between two different vertices from, from the point of view of this vertex is he called this edge seven from the other, the other one can call it five. It doesn't matter. I just label the, the edges around every vertices by some number. And now here is the space we are looking at. Let me define the code. The, the full space is going to be 
W all functions on the edges of the graph. Okay, now what is the what is the dimension of this? What is the dimension of this space? The dimension is, is simply the number of edges, right? So this is n of the code. In the dimension of W, this is m times r over 2, right? That's the number of edges in our regular graph on m vertices. And this will be called the large, uh, sorry, now I'm going to, to define the large code. The large code is going to be a subspace of W. With subspace, we look at all functions in W such that f restricted to the link of V is in C0 for every vertex V. You see, you remember, we label the edges around every vertex by the numbers 1 up to R. Now, if I have a function defined on all edges, and if I, if I sit on the one vertex, I see around myself R bits, right? But with, because I label the edges, what I really see is a vector in F2 to the R. The requirement that this local view of the vertex V will be in the small code. And this defines the large code. Okay, up to now, it's just a definition. And so, so, so uh, the, the large code is simply all the functions so that the local view is inside the small code. And here is the, theorem, the real theorem of Simpson Spielman is the following one. If the dimension of C0 is more than half of R, strictly more than half of R, and the distance of C0, just C0 is the subspace of F to do the R, I can talk about its distance. I want the distance to be more than lambda. Now, you remember, the distance should be a number between 0 to r, because we are in a r-dimensional space. Lambda x is also a number between 0 and r. Now, this is a kind of a strange inequality, because I relate two things which are totally unrelated in some sense, right? Like, like this is c0 is a code, is a subspace, and lambda is the eigenvalue of the graph, right? Anyway, that's the requirement, that the distance of C0 is more than that. Then what we get, the C that we get is LDPC, good code. Again, I hope by now it's clear to you, when I say code, I mean infinitely many. So now M is going to infinity, right? R is fixed, lambda is fixed, the C0 is fixed, but the graphs are going to infinity, so we are getting infinitely many codes, and they are good LDPC code. Why? Here is the proof. Why this is, usually LDPC is maybe the most difficult property to check, but it is trivial that it's LDPC. What is LDPC? LDPC means that the equations defining the code have bounded support, right? How did I define the code? I defined the code by the local views. Right? The local view should be inside a, some proper subspace. The local views mean that these are equations which sees each time only at most r, r, r bits, right? So this is trivial. What's the dimension of the code? Well, it's less trivial, but it's, a, it's first year undergraduate exercise, right? What's the dimension of a space? The dimension of a space is, the, is at least the full dimension minus the number of equations. How many equations I have? On every vertex, the number of vertices is m. The number of equations is the co-dimension of C0, right? In order to put the local view inside C0, I need r minus a uh, dim C0 equation. So, so I get, uh, this is the number, and now you, be, you should believe me for this computation. And, that's, and what it comes up, that this is equal to 2 over r, dimension of c0 minus r, r over 2. But you remember what, what, what we, do, we did assume, the dimension of c0 is strictly more than r over 2. So this is a positive constant. 
So we get that the dimension of C is some positive constant, at least some positive constant times n. Okay, so the dimension is, we have, the rate is okay, the rate is good. The, now, what about the, the distance of the big code? Here is slightly more difficult, but, but believe me, if I would have another seven minutes, I could even give you a full proof for that. Uh, but, but I'll give you an almost complete proof for that. Let, uh, let f be any, you remember, in order to prove that the code is good in the sense of distance, we have to prove that every vector in the code has very large support, right? That it is, uh, that it's, not, that, uh, the, the, it's a non-zero, right? The distance of a code is the minimum amming weight over all non-zero vectors in the code. So we take a non-zero function on the edges of the graph, which is inside the code, and, and uh, we call it little f, and let capital F be the support of that function. So these are the edges on which little f is non-zero. Let g be the subgraph of x spanned by this subset f of edges. And here is a little beautiful lemma of, uh, of uh, Alon and Chang. Again, the proof of this lemma is, is, uh, is, uh, is just really few lines. Um, if G is a subgraph whose average degree L, we take the average degree of this subgraph. If the average degree of the subgraph is strictly more than the, eigen, than the second largest eigenvalue of X, then the size of G is linear in the size of X. I mean, here is the constant, it doesn't matter for us what is the constant, that's the precise. Then the size of G is, li is linear, is some constant time x. You see, if L is strictly bigger, then this is a positive constant. This is the alon chang lemma. Why we can apply it? Because think about, what's the situation here? We take F, capital F, to be the set of all edges for which the function a, little f does not vanish. Look now at a vertex on that graph. And what is the degree of the, of the, of the spanning graph of f? The, the, the local degree is the number of bits for which little f is not zero. Right? But we assume we assume that this is more than lambda x. You see, we assume that the, di that the local distance is more than lambda x. So in our graph, not only that the average is more than lambda x, in every single vertex which is on the graph g, the degree is more than lambda x. So the assumption of the alon chang lemma are satisfied, and therefore the alon chang uh, uh, lemma, the, the, and therefore the, sup, the size of the graph is linear in x, and therefore the support is linear in x. That's the whole proof. Oh, yeah, I have to say now, I have to say now that we should really make sure that we can have C0 which satisfies these two conditions. C0 and that the, the, for a fixed R we have to prove that we can do it. And that's possible uh, uh, either by using Ramanujan graph, uh, we said that eigenvalue is very small, or you can actually, here you can use random graph Y, and still the construction will be considered as explicit because you do the random only one time, only for a fixed R. So you can kind of go over all the possibilities and the, the what, what is called the Vershamov, uh, what? Gilbert Vershamov inequalities assures you that you can find it. Okay, so that's kind of a classical code, coding theory. Okay, now I'm coming to the real uh, part of my talk, uh, <coughs> but I think it will be understood better in light of what I said so far. And this is the subject of locally testable code. Again, LTC 
in the usual language. In fact, uh, the work of Sip Sipser and Spielmann that I mentioned before was really the thesis of Spielmann under the supervision of Sipser. And in the introduction there, he really writes that his goal at the time, this was in the, in the mid-90s, was to get locally testable codes. So now, what is locally testable code? Uh, a, locally te a, a locally testable code is a code, C. Uh, again, when we say code, we always mean infinite family of code inside F to do the N. We say that this is Q epsilon locally testable if there exists a random algorithm A such that whenever alpha is in F2 to the N, A takes, A gets vector of length N, A allowed, the algorithm allowed to read only Q bits out of, out of, uh, of N. Q is going to be small. You are, you are allowed to read only small amount of bits out of the vector, and the algorithm should decide only based on that few bits whether the vector is inside the code or not. More precisely, that's, that's of course impossible because you can switch a little bit. Whether it is close to the code or really very far from the code. Like, it's not difficult to imagine why such a problem is, is of importance. You know, in coding theory, we, 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 n is going to infinity. The engineers used to laugh at us, mathematicians. Who cares about infinity? We work with code which are, you know, uh, 64, uh, 128 length, uh, 256. But the, in the old days, nowadays, they're really working with codes of length 200,000. 200,000 is it's like infinity in some sense. So, so now you don't want to get, to get a, a now you have error correcting codes which can correct 2%, 5% of mis, uh, uh, mistakes. If, if, if the vector is very corrupted, like 40% mistakes, then there is no chance to, uh, to correct it. You don't want to read all the 200,000 bits and then discover that you cannot correct it. You want to read only 70 bits, random bits, and then say, if it's too corrupted, send me again. So basically, but that's, that's the down to earth. It's extremely important for, applica for applications uh, related to what is called the property testing, PCP. Uh, let's see, I think you were one of the first to start all this area, so I'm afraid to talk in front of you. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, so, so the algorithm now is supposed to do the following. Uh, it, should, it should read a, a Q random bits of alpha, answer yes if alpha is in C, and answer no with probability go at least epsilon, the normalized distance between alpha and the code. Namely, if you are really far from the code, it should answer no. Okay, and you can make the probability to be as, as, as much as you want, just repeat the reading a few times, and then, and then you can get. Now, it's known, uh, it's known that LTC must be LDPC. So as I said, Spielman wanted to get LTC, and he managed to get LDPC, but not LTC. Uh, at the time. Why LTC? Uh, okay, hold, hold on, sorry. There were known LTC codes long ago, but not good ones. Okay, let me, let me maybe uh, mention very quickly a, a, a results which in a way started all this area of property testing. Here is a code. Uh, oh. Maybe I should hurry up and uh, uh, no, maybe, I, maybe I'll, I will skip it. There, uh, I just want to say there are codes which are known to be LTC. Namely, you can read only a few bits and decide whether you are inside the code or not. But they are not good. Either the distance is not good or the, or the, di or the dimension is not good. It's not linear in N. Uh, now there are, so this, uh, this is the linearity that reads Solomon. 
uh, I must say something about the tensor code. This is slightly more complicated, but I will need it in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in two minutes. So let me say here is a code which known to be LTC, but you'll see in a minute that it's not good. And this is the so-called the tensor code. What is a tensor code? You take two, uh, C1 to be a subspace of F2 to the N1 with some condition, the smooth code, doesn't matter, it's not difficult to, to achieve this, and C2 inside F2 to the N2. And you look at the tensor product of C1 and C2 inside Fn1 tensor F, F2, F2 N2. The best way to think about it is uh, N, uh, as, as you know, let's assume that N1 is equal to N2 and C1 is equal to C2. So the, the best way to think about it, you have, you have a subspace in F2, in F2 to the N. You take N by N matrices, and the code now is all the N by N matrices such that the rows and the columns satisfying the conditions to be in C1. Okay. Now <clears throat> this turns out to be to be an LTC code in the following sense, namely you want to decide if your matrix is inside the the code. You pick up a random column or a random row, and you read it and you you check if it is inside the code. But here the dimension of the code is n square, and you have to read n n bits, right? So, by the way, this is an untypical example because this, this example that when n goes to infinity, you can, you can, it can be a good code, it, uh, namely the distance will be linear, the, the dimension will be linear, but the number of bits grows to infinity with n. The, the only gray of the, of the area was to find uh, was to find um, a, 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 to find an LTC code which reads only bounded number of of bits. So that Q is bounded independent of n. Okay, it should be good code in the classical sense, namely the 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 rate and. The rate is constant, the normalized distance is constant, but also the number of queries, the number of bits that the algorithm can read is constant. It got the nickname of the CQ problem, constant rate, constant distance, and constant number of queries. Why this is such a difficult problem? First of all, if you think about it intuitively, then it's a it's little, little bit counterintuitive that something like that can, can, uh, can exist. And in, in fact, experts, we, uh, uh, were kind of disputed whether this is possible or not, include some, some, uh, some well-known experts who were disputed between, uh, 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 with themselves. Sometimes they conjecture that it's impossible, and sometimes they conjecture that it's possible, kind of they change their mind over the year. The real, the, the, the kind of the real reason uh, why this is, this is uh, difficult is that usually in this area, Random is the best, random is the king, like kind of Erdos type of uh, in commentary. Random is, is the king, and we try to mimic by uh, randomness by explicit constructions. Random codes, even LDPC random codes, are not LTC. So, so usually the, the joke about this is to say that if you know that random satisfy and you want to find an explicit construction, you are looking for an hay in, in, inside an hay stack. If you want, but we'll add to look for a needle inside an hay stack, and it was not even clear if this needle exists. So the good news that the needle exists, and here is the theorem. At the theorem, this is joint work with uh, Shai Evra, Ron Livne, uh, Iridinur, sorry, first of all, and, and Shachar Moses. 
that explicit construction of LTC good codes do exist with constant number. It's kind of amazing. This problem was open for like 30 years, and basically on the same week it was <laughs> announced by us and by, uh, and by two people in Moscow, uh, Pantelev and Kalachev. Uh, who came from a different angle, completely different angle. Uh, they were, their main interest was in a quantum error correcting code, something which called LDPC, quantum error correcting code. There was a major problem there. They solved it, and as a byproduct, they deduced this theorem. We work on that problem, we solved it. Recently, just a few weeks ago, Zemo put an interesting preprint, I have to admit I haven't read it yet, who show that one can start with our construction and, uh, and solve the quantum LDPC. So the two works seems to be somewhat related, though I have to admit that I don't understand it yet. It's on, on the on the problem. Okay, so now let me let me say what is our construction and say very quickly what's the point. Let G be a finite group with two symmetric set of generators. I take two set of generators to the finite group. Um, let, let me say right away, uh, maybe before even reading it, we are the group theorists. We are doing Cayley graph by now for, for more than 100 years. Uh, and you take, what, what is a Cayley graph? You take a group, you, f you, you, s you take a set of generators, and, you, and the, v the vertices are the elements of the group, and the edges is multiplication by the generators. I didn't say multiplication, how to multiply, from the right or from the left. Why I didn't say? Because it doesn't matter. If you think about it for a second, you see that the, the left Cayley graph and the right Cayley graph are really isomorphic. For some reason, I don't know, I'd be happy if somebody will correct me, don't know any work which was done in group theory which look at both together. Take two set of generators, multiply from one, by one set from one side and, and, and by the other set from the other side, and look at it as a cubical two-dimensional complex. That's what we are doing here. But we put some technical condition, just for simplicity, I don't think we really even need it, that uh, I take a finite group G and I take symmet a two symmetric set of generators, A and B, None of them contain the identity, and also I assume that they are totally non-conjugate. You see, I also start to talk with the initials. Uh, for every A in A and B in B and G in G, G minus 1 A, G is not B, namely no element of B is conjugate to any element of, of A. And then we, uh, for simplicity, let's assume that the size of them is the same and, and, and assume that both of them are the Cayley graph are Ramanujan. We don't really need it, but we know to do it, so why not, why not to use it? So the, the two, these two Cayley graphs, both Cayley graphs are, are Ramanujan. Now, what is now the, con what, what are our codes? Our, uh, uh, so sorry, first of all, I look at what now we call left-right Cayley complexes. So these are obtained by letting A act on G from the left and B from the right. So now I get squares, right? I start with G, I act from the left by A to get AG, from the right to get GB, now I act by A to get AGB, I, I act by B again to get AGB. So I'm getting a, I'm getting a, a two-dimensional object, not a one-dimensional object. Uh, um, and now uh, the, the condition ensure that all vertices, all the four are different. All together there are G times A times B divide by four squares. Now, again, the way we think about it is that A and B are of fixed size, of size R, and G, the size of G is going to infinity. Now, we fix a code CA in F2 to the A to be a smooth code, whatever it means. It takes CB to be another code. It, it, it doesn't have to be another. You can take the same code. You look at the tensor 
of, of both of them. Now, be careful here. Now R, I'm taking the tensor code as I explained before, but I'm taking it for a fixed R, not for R going to infinity. Okay? <clears throat> now think about it. If you think about it, you see that if you fix G and you look at all square, little g, and all the squares around G, the squares touching G are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the direct product of A cross B. So I, I assume now you can guess where I'm adding to because, oops, sorry, because now I can define the code. The code will be like, like the simple Spinman code, but a second floor above it. The second floor will be, I'm looking at W to be all the functions on the squares such that if I reduce a function to the link of every G, what, 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 what a function sees? It sees many squares touching this G, but then these squares are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the set A cross B. Namely, this is like a matrix R cross R. I want it to be in the tensor code. I explained before that this tensor code was LTC, but not good when R going to infinity. But, but in my code now, R is not going to, to infinity. R is fixed. Okay? And now our theorem says that you have to put some assumption that I, I, I didn't want to bother to, to write it, not to take your attention. They are more complicated than the formulas of Sipser and Spielman. You have to make some assumption on the starting on the small code. And if you, the, 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 the assumption can, are, are, can be satisfied, then what we get here is LTC code. And what is the algorithm? You can guess. The algorithm is pick a random vertex and check if the function around that vertex indeed in the small tensor code. How do you prove it? The proof is, 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 is more, much more complicated than uh, the Sipser Spinman. Actually, not, uh, part of it is just repeating the Sipser Spinman. It's basically uh, to prove the, the dimension and the distance is basically just like the Sipser Spielman. What the Sipser Spielman method is to propagate from local to global. You know some assumption on the local code about its dimension and about its distance, and you propagate it to the large code. So, so morally, we are doing the uh, similar thing. We have local testability of the small code which is a tensor code, and we propagate it to the large code. Okay? That's, this is, the, this is the, the end of my elementary talk. The last three minutes, I want to do something very non-elementary. I'll have to rush through it, and hopefully it will make sense to, to you or to some of you. And this is, the old proof of our uh, paper is completely, it's completely elementary. One can really teach it in, uh, it, it takes more time, it's more complicated, but can teach it in undergraduate course. But it took us four years to get to that. We went through a much longer way. We, we wanted to use, and I want to explain this philosophy because somehow maybe I'm just uh, subjectively still in love with it, but maybe there is a message here. And this is the whole area of I-dimensional expander. Why I-dimensional expander and locally testable code are so much related? Here is the story. So what I said, why did we go to dimension two? We were really inspired by the notion of I-dimensional expander. Um, what is I-dimensional expander? I define two expander graphs. And in the last 15 years, few of us were building an I-dimensional theory of expander graph under the title I-dimensional expander. Uh, <coughs> here is like the, uh, some of the history. Let G be a periodic simple Lie group. Let's say the G is SLN QP. Let gamma be a co-compact lattice in G, namely a discrete subgroup in G, so the G mod gamma is co-compact. 
in, in the 70s, Garland proved a conjecture of Sir, saying that if I is less, strictly less than the rank of G, the rank of a Lie group like SLN is N minus 1, then the cohomology of gamma vanish for every unitary, uh, 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 for every, say, irreducible in unitary representation of V. Well, he proved it to finite dimension, and then people extend it. But what did he really prove? What did really Garland prove? And I have to, I have to admit that I, 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 I'm coming from this area, so I knew this proof for many years, but only my kind of romance with, with computer science opened my eyes to see that he proved the local to global results exactly of the kind of property testing that, uh, let's see, you are partially and Avi responsible to, that, it's, that the philosophy is really there, why? Because what he really proved is the following. Let B be the Boatis building associated with this Lie group G. Uh, uh, on over Piadi groups, you have Boatis building replacing the so-called symmetric spaces for real, for real Lie groups. And so what is this? This is a constructible um, simplicial complex whose dimension is equal to the rank. So for SL2, oh, this is, this is, sorry, this is a typo. For SL2QP, the, the rank is uh, uh, n minus 1 is 2, is 1, so this is a, a, a graph. Now you look at the B mod gamma is a finite simplicial complex. If n is equal to, you get graph, and the Ramanujan graphs that I constructed with uh, Sarnak and Phillips long ago were obtained like that. Uh, when uh, we used the lean work and, uh, and Drinfel work, etc., when uh, Laforgue proved the, Ram the I-dimensional Ramanujan conjecture, got the Fields Medal for that, we, we realized that this has a combinatorial meaning and we constructed Ramanujan complexes. I, uh, to be honest, we constructed them just because they were so beautiful. But Garland work, what Garland really proved, he proved even before we did our work. He proved that uh, the, the Sir conjecture about vanishing of the cohomology, this is a spectral graph, a, a spectral gap for I-dimensional Laplacian. He looked just at the links of, of uh, vertices, and the links of these buildings are very clear. They are flag complexes of finite fields, which are, uh, it's easy to compute their Laplacians. There is a clear spectral gap there, and he proved the local to global spectral gap. He proved that if the local links as spectral gap, you can deduce a global spectral gap. Now, there is nothing like that for graphs. I don't have time to explain it. You really go to the I-dimensional for that. This is a truly I-dimensional phenomenon that you don't have for graphs. You have it only in dimension two and above. So somehow, this hit me like only four or five years ago, and ever since then, I kind of religiously believe that what one should do is to get the Sister Spielman codes from dimension one to, to higher dimensional in order to solve the LTC, because LTC is exactly that. So we went to, to, uh, we went to study for that uh, the so-called uh, periodic uniformization in order to get, I don't have time to explain that, in order to get uh, the, the cohomology and the beautiful mathematics. We learned eventually it was not needed. Luckily, uh, we had Iri Dinur in our team who kept us down to earth. And once we were talking about that, he said, why do we need all this? You can do just that. And eventually, <laughs> we, we went to that and we ended up with doing something much more elementary. But it was an exciting uh, story that I could not resist uh, not sharing with you. So thank you very much. <laughs>